Welcome to Whisking It All with your host, Angela Pizzito, co-founder of Whisk.ai, a food and beverage intelligence platform. We're going to be interviewing hospitality professionals around the world to really understand how they do what they do. Welcome to another episode of Whisking It All. We're here today with the CEO of Cubo, Juan Orego. Juan, thank you for being here today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Angelo. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I guess maybe to kick things off, for people who don't know what Cubo is, can you maybe give a quick description? Yeah, so Cubo is um, sort of like an ordering stack for restaurants. We help restaurants with uh, direct ordering uh, so people can order directly from their website. We also aggregate all their third-party orders from uh, platforms like DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grub Pub, Skip the Dishes, etc., all in one place. Um, make sure those orders get sent to the POS automatically. Um, we just released a new product actually called uh, Cubo Kiosks, which is pretty self-explanatory by helping restaurants with self-ordering and you know with the many issues that are happening in the industry with labor, just making mm. sure they have a little bit more support uh, and can support that autonomous ordering. Um, so super exciting times. Awesome. So we'll definitely dive more into Cubo. I'd love to see you know where you guys are at today, where you're heading, learn more about you know what types of restaurants yep. you serve and what type of uh, benefits they can gain. But maybe to just take a few steps back and I'm also a big fan of understanding the entrepreneurial journey behind things. So, you know, tell me a bit about you. Tell me a bit about Juan. Where did you start or, you know, a couple years back? How did you get to Cubo? Yeah, so, you know, just like we were talking about before the, before, you know, press record. So born in Colombia and you're married to a Colombian. So, you know, we're very entrepreneurial. Yeah. And uh, I think the stats, something like 50% of Colombians are entrepreneurs, something like that. Oh, wow. A lot of it is due to poverty, of course, like people just kind of have to create their own opportunities. But both my parents are entrepreneurs and I always knew that I was going to end up working for myself. Mm. Um, I was born and raised in the Caribbean, Colombia, but I moved to Canada when I was 17. And I always had um, small businesses on the side, you know, like I had a, like an online jewelry business. Um, even when I was a kid, like selling ice cream door to door to my neighbors and whatnot. Eventually, uh, I ended up getting into restaurants. So I started working for this food truck and that's what helped me pay for school in Canada. And after a few years, really understood the industry. Um, but I ended up getting a, another job at a, at a tech startup. And that's kind of how I started in the tech world as well. Mm. Um, after a few months, I wasn't a very good employee. Ended up getting fired. I was a sales rep. I did a Mikora. <laughs> and um, it was like really like three months in or something. And so I was like, you know what? I am actually going to just um, try and create my own company. Like maybe the world is just trying to tell me that this is my time. So I'm going to go all in um, and try to combine both the experiences that I uh, have had for the lo longest period of time in my career, I was fairly young. I was 21 or 22. So it's not like I had been working for a decade or anything like that. But, right. you know, I had work we worked for a few years in the Russian industry and then just a few months in tech. And so I was like, I'm going to teach myself how to code and I'm going to create something for restaurants. And Cuba was born. We were actually a analytics company at first um, with the main premise that restaurateurs make a lot of decisions based on gut feeling. But in yeah. the startup world, I saw that most of the decisions were made through data. And so I wanted to apply that same thought process to the Russian industry, but it didn't really work. I uh, couldn't really sell it. And after a lot of conversations, I heard from a restaurant that they had a lot of trouble with uh, delivery orders. And this was back in 2018, 2019, where DoorDash was starting to grow really quick. Mm. Grubhub was growing really quick. They were the biggest at the time. Uber Eats was starting to venture into their food delivery business. And um, people just wanted a way to send those orders directly to the POS so they don't have to pay someone to manually enter those orders and make mistakes. And so I said, that sounds great. It's kind of crazy that this is how, that yeah. this doesn't exist. It, it's a no brainer. And so I developed it, learned how to code, um, you know, eventually hired a couple developers, recruited our co founder, CTO, and we went to market in 2019. And, um, you know, a year before COVID. So, uh, you know, as soon as COVID hit, everything went from zero to not a hundred, honestly, went to like a million, like we went from zero <laughs> to like 80 employees in like a year and a half. Like it was something I never imagined could wow. happen in my first like real venture. So it was kind of crazy, wow. but really cool to help restaurants through that tough time. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, 
Yeah, there's certain industries where things really kind of took off, and and obviously like restaurants got hit hard. But I mean the yeah. the flip side of of what happened was exactly that. It was a lot a spike in online ordering,、uh, and the revival of the QR code that came back, and it was like. Yes, I don't、yeah. know. It must have been like ten years ago. I can't even remember, but like it kind of yeah, so came. Yes, it's a blackberry or something. Yeah, yeah. And then it was like a bit nerdy, so like it kind of went away, and then like all of a sudden it just kind of came back, and now it's like back. Now, now it's cool again. It's funny. You got a second shot yeah, at, yeah, yeah. and it's it's cool again. It's on the menu. You can pay your tab. You can see the menus. You know, so it's funny how it made a comeback. But yeah, so I'd, I'd love to hear like what was the big pain point you saw at the time. So you know, for a lot of restaurants listening, for them it's obvious. They're like, I、yeah. you know the pain. But for people who are maybe not as well versed. Speak a bit about the pain of what they typically do before using something like Cubo. Yeah, so you know, you're a restaurant. You understand that you want to be on delivery apps, right? Your food travels well. You have a little bit of bandwidth in the kitchen, so you end up signing up for DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub. You want to be on all of them. It's kind of what we see normally works the best because、yeah. if you're not on DoorDash, people that are on DoorDash are never going to order from you. It's kind of the thought process in in the, in the consumer market for these delivery apps. And so,、um, you know, you sign up for all those delivery apps, but then what ends up happening is all of them send you their own tablets because they need to communicate to you when an order comes in.、Mm. Um, actually, when we started, a lot of people even used fax, which was super crazy. No, yeah. So, so they would get the orders through fax, print, and then they would,、uh, whether you got it on the tablet or fax, you would have to enter that into the POS so、mm. that the order gets recorded. You know, your inventory、yeah. gets accounted for. The order prints in the kitchen. Um, and restaurants started to see that not only was it super slow, but rest, you know their employees normally are really young. They're so overwhelmed with the volume, they start making mistakes. They instead of entering a burger, they enter a hot dog, and the customer gets the wrong order. They have to remake it. Their reputation、oh. gets tarnished.、And、so that's when they start looking for something like Cubo. And we've evolved the product into more than just that, more than just integrating that order.、Um, you know, we help restaurants with. Making sure that the orders get auto accepted in like less than a second, so、wow. the delivery apps are seeing, wow, this restaurant is really quick. Every time we send them an order, the customer receives a notification that they're they're preparing the order right away. So let's start ranking them higher and higher because less cancellations are happening, and so it kind of snowballs into like more volume, less mistakes, easier to handle. You can be on all the delivery apps at the same time. Um, wow. And then there's like the menu management, right? Inventory when you run out of something, like making sure it's get eighty six, etc., etc. Wow. Okay. And I, I can I can imagine, you know, you alluded to obviously the, the the time side of things, so just being super time consuming and inefficient to just have to literally copy paste an order. But in addition, even if in a perfect world that you know it's taking time, there's the mistake side, and so you're, you're making mistakes. And that has effects. Do you have an idea of like what that mistake rate was? Like how many orders were、yeah. an average? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. So when we st- we measure that super early on, and what we saw was out of ten orders, between one to three would normally、wow. have a mistake, which、What's、was because a lot of them it, it's not just the item; it's like small modifications, right? If、mm. you want your fries on the side, or if you want your sauce on on the side, or something like that, and it's just so overwhelming for the staff to have to handle all those small details. Notes. A lot of people would ask for. Hey, can I actually? You know, I didn't see fries on the apps. Can I have an order of fries? So, hey, how do we charge for that? They didn't pay for that. It's a note. So, you know, there, a lot、wow. of errors would start to come up, and it was actually one to three out of ten. That's super significant. Yeah. yeah, yeah.、Um, and again, in the peak of COVID, like, you know, it, it, we had such overwhelming demand for something like Cuba because everybody just needed to get on the apps, ensure that they could handle handle it as quickly as possible.、Um, Yeah, like I said early on, it was awesome to help them out through all that. That's awesome. And so when you guys started, if I'm not mistaken, you guys were or are based in Victoria, BC. Is that yeah?、Right? Cool. So you yeah, guys started、right. there. I love to hear the journey because you know half of this is 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 you know talking to restaurateurs, but also half of this is really understanding that entrepreneurial side. So you know you kind of your path led to you to being that entrepreneur from your your, your DNA, that family.、Um, you know, it's in your blood kind of thing. And then. You started in Victoria. What does that getting that first you know restaurant or two look like, and then what、yeah. what happens after that? It's really funny because you know first entrepreneurs kind of have a hard time like pricing their product and they like really underprice it and stuff. So we I started selling to restaurants in Victoria. I think they just kind of saw this like skinny like immigrant kid like you know there's no way this kid's gonna build this product so like they would just they just didn't pay anything. So then I was like, yeah,、hey, I'm not selling anything in Victoria. Let me try Vancouver. Um, which is just like an hour and a half away, quite a big city. 
And we got our first two customers like pretty much instantly, but paying like 20 bucks a month. And, um, but I was honestly scrambling, like just making a lot of cold calls and cold emails and stuff. So, um, I just kind of one day looked at San Francisco and pulled the Google maps and started cold calling them. And, um, you know, eventually someone wanted to buy it. They were like, what's the price? And I was charging 20 Canadian a month. I was just like 60 us <laughs> to, just to try, try and gauge. They were like done. I was like, holy wow, like I could probably charge a lot more for this. So eventually awesome. we started testing with our pricing and stuff. Um, but yeah, the first sale honestly was just like all hustle, like just trying yeah. to get someone to, to listen to me. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, I'm sure you can relate to this, but I find most entrepreneurs, including myself, when you get that first sale, the feeling is amazing. Even though like you could so be in so, so much important. debt. Yeah. Yeah. You spent like <laughs> a year developing something in debt, but then you get like 20 bucks, but like there's something about someone paying for something that you thought of and built that is yeah, so yeah. gratifying. Right. For me, it was just like so much rejection. Like you were, I was trying to fundraise cause I, you know, like, um, I didn't have like a friends and family that I could raise. So like fundraising, I was just hearing no after no after no. And then trying to sell Cubo to restaurants, like no after no after no. And before that we were analytics. So like a million no's before, uh, before we became, uh, like what we are today. Right. So hearing that, like hearing someone say yes, you're like, cool. Once the payment goes through, it was actually super, I still vividly remember when I got the, not the email that someone had paid and it was just like, I was a crack. Like it was cool. <laughs> That's so amazing, happy. man. Yeah, it's such a good feeling. And so just to paint the picture, so people have, you know, three tablets and, you know, for people that maybe don't, most people, most restaurateurs experience this, but for those who, who don't and are listening and just as, you know, regular kind of audience members. So you can imagine, you know, one tablet for Uber Eats, one for DoorDash, one for, for whatever other system, and skip the dishes and you end up getting these orders. So now you have three tablets on top of your POS. So when you guys come in, just to paint the picture, is it that it's connected directly to the POS or is it that now it's on your kind of tablet and you can consolidate all those on, on your tablet? Like, tell me a bit about like the logistics of, of how that works. Yeah. So, uh, both we send the order to the POS, but then we also provide the restaurant with one tablet so that they can get rid of the other three. Okay. This is something that we debated a lot early on. Do we just send everything to the POS and we tried, but what we ended up discovering was in a utopian world, you can get rid of your tablets, have everything go to the POS, it prints awesome. But a lot of, you know, like customers can, can write notes. Um, that's normally things that they want to add to the items that mm. they're not paying for. Uh, or, you know, say that they, um, the restaurant ran, ran out of an item that was ordered. They need to refund it, make sure that the inventory updates. POS is one really built with that use case in mind. And so what we started to see was that restaurants started using the tablets again. Um, and it was really important for me that we were the universal remote control for the restaurant so that the pain of tablet, what we call tablet hell, could actually be solved by what mm. the service that we were providing. And so that's why we ended up developing this one tablet, which again acts sort of like a universal remote control so that the restaurants don't have to use the other three tablets and they don't have to touch it. You know, everything runs on autopilot. But when something arises, they can still go to that tablet and interact mm. with the order, their menu, the customer, whatever they want. Got it. Got it. And so, and so what does your typical customer see like pre Cubo and post Cubo? So, you know, talking a bit about the pain, three tablets down to one time savings. What, are there any metrics that you guys have that you say, Hey, we're able to help with this in terms of, you know, bottom line or, or, or even yeah. Top line? Absolutely. So not only the, the errors that we were talking about earlier, the 10 to 30% error rate, which is pretty high. Yeah. Um, we completely eliminate that because we, there's truly no human involved. Um, but we also start to see that restaurants very quickly, um, get more sales on the delivery apps. Mm. And that's where that, you know, auto accept it, it, delivery apps are really interesting because they have this and a lot of people don't know this, but they have this sort of algorithm very similar to Google because they are, they want to make sure that whoever they're ranking high is going to make the money. If they're sending volume to the wrong restaurant and they have to refund that order, then they probably tarnish that relationship with the customer forever. True. And it's so competitive. Now there's Uber Eats, Grubhub, you know, DoorDash, Chow Now, and a million others. Um, but in between the big three, people are going to switch back and forth if the experience in one isn't, isn't ideal. And so that's why we started to develop this sort of like, you know, auto accept. Let's make sure that the delivery apps are liking the restaurant. Um, someone orders from 
whatever restaurant, we accept the order in literally 0.1 seconds is what we have tracked, which is much faster than a human. So the restaurant starts to rank high. Now there's also less errors. So the delivery app is starting to see, huh, look, the refund rate on this restaurant is actually a lot uh, smaller than it is for other people around the delivery radius. So let's make, rank them even higher. Um, every time that the customer orders something, they do end up delivering it. They don't have issues with inventory. And that's because now instead of them managing three menus, they only have to manage everything in, in one platform, which is Kibo. Um, so it's a really comprehensive, you know, set of small features that when you aggregate them all, right. it not only helps you save the, the relationships, which is obviously something you can't really measure, but then there's the food costs and eventually the increase in sales. Mm -hmm. And hopefully restaurants can also start to add more delivery apps as well. Hopefully they can see, you know, this is really easy. Actually, there's no extra work in me adding maybe an own, uh, you know, direct ordering solution commission free that I can have on my own website. Now I don't have another tablet to manage. I can just manage it all through Kibo anyways. So really right. isn't any extra work. Right. That makes a ton of sense. And so who would you say is like your, your typical audience, right? Like, Obviously, restaurant industry is massive. Who who do you guys know like for sure? If you're X Y Z, this is like kind of a perfect fit for you. Yeah. So normally we are working with um, you know quick service restaurants. Technically, anyone that delivers could be okay. a fit. Okay. But normally, you know, you don't have steakhouses on the delivery apps because they the, the steak just doesn't travel as well. It happens. Yeah. We do have customers like that, and we can we can help them. Um, but where we find that a restaurant is the most successful is they have a really quick service. They can make food in five to 15 minutes. Hmm. Um, the food is going to travel well. So whether it's you know, burgers or sandwiches or pizza, you know, that's sort of like yeah. fast food. Um, and then in terms of size, you know, we don't like to work with, um, big, big corporations like McDonald's and Burger King, they can, they have the resources to develop their own solutions. Right. Obviously if they came knocking on the door, we'd love to work with them. That'd be, that'd be mm -hmm. awesome for our business, but, but they have the resources to build themselves. Right. Um, so we try to focus on those, you know, smaller players. We do work with franchises, but normally like 500 locations will probably be where we max out. Okay. Um, but on anything in that, like one to a hundred locations, that's really where we thrive. We do really, really well. Awesome. And then I can imagine because you're dealing with QSRs, you know, one to hundred locations, um, there's probably a handful of POSs. So on one side, you're integrating with obviously the, the delivery apps on the flip side, yeah. you got to put that in the POS. So, um, what do you guys find so far? The main, you know, Whisk integrates with a ton of POSs as well because of our solution, but I'm curious on your side, what do you see that as the main POSs in, in that space or at least for your target market? <clears throat> yeah. So I love working with Square. They're, one of our um like really close partners their team is awesome um clover is another great mm. pos that we love to work with revel um you know if a restaurant is looking for a pos i think those are you know i have we operate we work with so many um but the ones that i see normally do really well with this like qsr market uh, Rebel, Clover, Square. There's a few others, depending on where you are, that might have a better solution. For example, uh, in Canada, we up, we work with this POS called Often. They're just really familiar with the Canadian market. Hmm. And they may be a, a better fit. I think all these POSs, the POS market is so competitive, they all yeah. need to have really robust solutions to be yeah. able to stay in business. There's just small differences that might work better for whatever the use case is. Right. So I can look at you know, your audience in the eyes and tell them, okay, go talk to this one. But yeah, yeah. Um, I know based on market share, based on what I see, you know, customer happiness, if I were to open a restaurant today, I think, you know, Square, Clover, Rebel will probably be the main POSs that I would, that I would like to look at, ignoring yeah. any, any specific use cases, of course. Right, right, right. Yeah. And we see it too. Like our clients ask us all the time, like what POS do you recommend? And, and the truth is like, we integrate with, I think 60 ish now. Um, yeah. and, and it's funny cause you hear a good and bad things about the exact same POSs. People will say like POS exactly. X is the best. And then this, someone else is like POS X is the worst. So what I realize is like, it's a really, like, it depends on what you need, the type of restaurant, you know, QSR versus maybe fast casual versus full service. The, are you a group and you need group functionality? Are you a single venue? There's so many cases and then you can at least narrow it down. And even within that, there'll be differences where people will swear by one or swear by the other. So I got yeah. to the point where I'm like, Hey, look, these are the ones we integrate really well with because we have a direct API. 
you choose, <laughs> you know, like yeah, you exactly. choose. <laughs> don't let, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want you calling me telling me that you, you're not happy with your POS. Um, yeah. Just like anything. It just truly, truly depends. Even with our own solutions, like it just truly depends. Right. 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 That makes sense. Cool. So to just to get a sense, I know you said maybe about, correct me if I'm wrong, about 80 employees. Is that, is that about right? Yeah. So that was during the peak of COVID. Market okay, okay. has changed over, yeah, right. yeah, okay, market changed over the past couple of years. But okay, yeah. okay. 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 But so that growth, I mean, nonetheless, even if you tell me, you know, 40, still, still a lot yeah. of employees, right? So um, I'd love to like learn a bit about that growth, right? Those first two locations, like you said, then you realize, you start realizing, okay, what can we charge? What was like the go to market? How do you start, you know, COVID helped, I'm assuming, but how do you start kind of going to market and, and what markets are you serving today? Yeah, so we're primarily in the States and Canada. We have a okay. handful of restaurants in like Europe and Australia and stuff like that. But North America is really where um, where we're focused right now. During COVID, um, our go-to-market motion has changed a little bit after COVID. But during COVID, we were such a young company that we didn't really have any, like we didn't have a marketing engine. Everything was outbound. We kind of have to source our own opportunities. So it was cold right. calling, but cold emailing worked really well for us early on. Um, and restaurants loved it because they didn't know there was a solution out there. And um, they knew that they needed the delivery apps. A lot of them were starting to use them. Right. And then we would reach out and say, hey, we have the solution that integrates, you know, with your delivery apps. And almost everyone would say, yeah, absolutely. I would love to hear a little bit more about what you have. Post COVID, then the intent uh, definitely dropped because restaurants were already on the delivery apps. I think almost mm. everybody signed up for delivery apps in the peak of COVID in order to be able to survive. Right. Um, and so we started to have, uh, we started to develop our own marketing engine. So putting a lot of resources and content out there. So if you go to our blog um, or you subscribe to our newsletter, we have a lot of um, great stuff. We also have eBooks and stuff that we write. So restaurants just find us through that. Awesome. Or if you look up for, you know, integrations, we're normally number one and on Google as well. So it's, it's switched a little bit more to, to inbound nowadays. People mostly search for us. That's awesome. That's a, that's, a, that's a great place to be. And so I guess for you guys, there's not really a geographical boundary minus just maybe in different geographies outside of US Canada. Maybe it just means different delivery apps or different POSs, but like... Exactly. Okay. But ultimately it doesn't really matter. It's just more from a development and marketing standpoint, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Like, we technically, we can just develop, a, say, you know, Globo or Deliveroo, like those European delivery apps. We can just build them tomorrow. But the problem is that we also would need a support team to support them. Right, and, time zones. Um, the you know the the yeah the time zones that go to market is also a little bit different. There's the GDPR. There's a few things that, right. and, and honestly, at the end of the day, our market share in North America compared to what's out there, very, very small. Like right. we still have a so, lot of room to cover. So right. we don't want to go to Europe knowing that we're still nowhere where we yeah. want to be in North America. That makes sense. If you're like still scratching the surface because of how big the market is, it's like keep scratching, you know, before spreading yourself to there. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd love for you if you can share, I mean, I'm sure there's a ton of success stories, but any success stories that kind of stand out to you, like in terms of like a client using Cubo that you just, you know, you maybe share with your staff or it's, you know, known company wide. Yeah. So there's a couple, a couple of things. So like in 2019, when we, um, had just launched, we got accepted into Y Combinator, which nice. was a dream for me. Um, cause you know how hard it is to get in. It, yeah. You know, I, I was a terrible student, so I was like prepared to be rejected cause I got rejected from all the schools. Um, but getting to YC is harder than getting into Harvard. And so I was just so proud of, I, like I would tell my mom, I was like, I didn't get into Harvard, but I got into Y Combinator. And it was just an unbelievable experience. And that's probably one of the proudest moments of my life that's was awesome. building something and then having them believe in me. Um, we moved down to Silicon Valley for three months. There's this one spot that we absolutely loved, which was Snake the Greek uh, in San Jose. You, if you're ever there, you should check it out because their food is unbelievable. And we would order from them pretty much every week. <laughs> they had, I think, two or three locations at the time. And we started pestering them, being like, hey, we're down in the valley. Like, we love your food. We would love to work with you. Um, eventually, you know, the program ended. We couldn't, we actually, they never responded. And after a year or so, we ended up engaging with them. And now they're one of our largest customers, actually. Like, they have tens and tens of locations. They signed oh, wow. more franchisee agreements as of recently. I think they're on, on track to be 100 plus by the end of next year. And wow. that's just awesome, you know, seeing them not only grow, but also like how um, it, it just reminds me of the of the time when we were down there, which was so special for me personally. 
Um, awesome. But also seeing them grow and then be a part of that growth is really cool. That, that is really cool. And and yeah, for for people listening that m- might not know, there's there's a few you know acceler. I mean, there's many accelerators, but there's a few really like high level ones. YC is probably the top. Um, you know, I'd say another big one is TechStars. Uh, yeah, we were part of TechStars, which was fun. And TechStars yeah. was. Um, I think when we went, uh, they, there was like 600 something applicants mm-hmm. and they chose 10 companies. So, and it was cool because it was uh, so competitive. Yeah, it's super competitive. And that one was, I think, at the time was the first tech stars in Canada because tech stars is worldwide, whereas YC is, I think, is just yeah. one, right? Yeah. It's uh, the one. They only have one in right, Silicon right, right. Valley. Yeah. yeah. Although they went remote during COVID, but I think they went back to doing it all in person. And okay, yeah, tech stars, okay. I also like really. Uh, looked up to Techstars. Like if we, th- the reason why we didn't apply to Techstars is because they had invested in a competitor, ah, okay. and we knew they weren't gonna invest in us. Yeah, that um, makes sense. But then we got into Y Combinator, which, which is huge. Which was yeah. that was my dream. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. Yeah, I mean, if you get into these things, that like, it, I mean, they they are what exactly what they sound like. They're accelerators for an entrepreneur. It's an entrepreneur's yeah. dream. You get a bit of capital. You get a lot of guidance and direction, and it and it just accelerates the the, the progress. Typically, you you get good introductions to to VCs as well, which can help with the fundraising. So it's it's yeah. you know for uh, startups listening out there trying to get into an accelerator could could be a good move a lot of the times, not always, but it, a lot of the times it could yeah. be. Yeah, you meet a lot of cool people. Yeah. Like I I met yeah the CEO of Airbnb Brian Chesky. Like how else would I be able to meet him if it's if you know if it wasn't for YC? It's you know stuff like that was that's unbelievable. That's awesome. Um, I'd love to hear just a bit about like your journey kind of as a leader, right? So you go from, like you said, like not having that sales job, right? Which is not representative, yeah. but you know, it takes a shot to be go like, ah, whatever. And then totally. you kind of, and then you kind of go into boom, I'm into YC. I'm a CEO for the first time, which is hard because it's like you're learning as you're growing. Like, what does that journey look like from the CEO? What are some, I always like kind of sharing lessons that people learn. Like, what are some lessons you learned as kind of a leader in the last few years? Yeah. Yeah, you know, like like with with anything that is new, you suck at the beginning. As a matter of <laughs> fact, I mean, there's levels, right, to, yeah. to everything you do, and so you're always trying to get better. Um, I think when I started, I was just so young, I was so hungry, like I, you know, I just wanted to make this a success because I had no other option. Um, so it was all me just doing anything and everything myself. Eventually, as we started to grow. Then I start to read a little bit and, and experience, you know, managing a team, leadership, you know, motivating people, firing people, which actually never gets easier. Yeah. Um, performance. It's it's I think really hard. The, the thing for me is I am really, really competitive. And I think that defines my leadership style of mm. um we, I want us to be the best that we can be. And I love hiring um, athletes, you know, people that thrive under high pressure, you know, fast moving environments, um, never settling, mm. you know, I'll work everyone else. Um, that's sort of like, as cliche as it sounds like David Goggins, sort of like, yeah, yeah. you know, hey, like, let's, like, we, you, you know, you, with your mind, you can control anything and everything. And that's kind of what I try to tell my team that we can, if we want to be a billion dollar company, we can be a billion dollar company. But it's going to be hard and we need to put in the work. Um, And with that, you know, it's uh, I think the biggest thing for me was getting used to the fact that um, it's about as a leader is about how do you get people to respect you? Whereas early on, I was more it was more like, how do I get people to like me? Hmm. And I when I talk to a lot of new leaders, there's that really, you know, hard transition of them being like, Oof, but I don't want to give them the feedback because like, what if that they take it the wrong way? And I think that was something that eventually clicked again, as with everything you start to learn and it's, you know, they actually don't have to like me. They, they just have to respect me. Yeah. And if they want to be the best version of themselves, then they have to, they have to hear this feedback. And uh, people actually, uh, unlike what I would have guessed back, back in the day, people like it. People want to hear if they're doing good or bad. People want yeah. to know how they can get better. Yeah. Um, and a good leader has that sort of like radically candid, you know, like radi- what do they call it? The uh, radical candor of yeah. being able to be respectful, give feedback, but be direct enough for people to understand exactly where they're at. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's funny. It's something I learned too because, you know, similar to you, I didn't have like career jobs. I just kind of was always in a t- startup and then three, four years yeah. and failed in a new startup and failed and you started now. Now it's WISC um, and it's doing well, but like took kind of a lot of failures. But 
in doing that, there's a lot of things that I just didn't know that like later you start to kind of appreciate You're like, oh, I get why like people document everything and why there's yeah. SOPs. And I get like you start and one of those things that what you alluded to is that feedback. And I realized like I'm not the type of guy that likes too, too much. Like not that I don't like feedback, I like feedback, but I don't like too, too much constraints. But a lot of people or too many constraints, I should say, but a lot of people actually thrive on that. If you're like, hey, this is the plan. This is where you can be in six months this is where you can be in a year. This is kind of the layout. This is how you can climb the ladder. Most people thrive. And then for me, it was something I had to learn because yeah. I was like that 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 was new to me. Right. So it, it's super interesting. So um, yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear maybe just to kind of, uh, you know, for people listening, how can they sign up for Cubo. I know you said, obviously, you know, you got do a lot more inbound, but like, let's say there's a restaurant here listing or a franchise listing, a mm-hmm. QSR, like, man, I want to give this a shot. So what do they got to do to sign up? And what does the process look like? Yeah, so you can email us at sales at Cubo.com. Cubo is spelled C-U-B as in boy, O-H. Um, kind of like as in cube. <clears throat> or you can go to Cubo.com and then just click on get a demo or get cool. started right at the top and it'll take you to a forum. The process is super easy. It takes about a couple of weeks to get set up, which is mostly the delivery apps have a schedule where a schedule where they migrate people over from their own tablet over to our integration. Um, and they do that every Wednesday. So we just kind of have to line up the timeline stuff. But on average, it takes about a couple of weeks, mostly because of that. Um, and we honestly do most of the work. We handhold um, all the restaurants throughout throughout the process. They go live in a couple of weeks and it's as easy as that. Restaurants start seeing their orders in the new tablet, which we ship over to them and the orders uh, flow into the POS as well. They print in the kitchen and whatnot. Um, customer support is super important to me. Like I said, I'm all about excellence and making sure that people have a, a really good experience. Um, so we reply to everyone in under five minutes. Wow. You know, I, I did support for years and years and years. Uh, until like a year and a half ago where I eventually delegated it over to a leader, but I'm still very involved. I want to ensure that everybody from the moment that they buy, they understand, okay, like um, it's technology. Obviously there might be issues, but if they do arise, there's a team right here that's, you know, willing to help me. And we're the friendly Canadians, right? Like we, when someone calls us, we just want to help. That's awesome. And I guess like for, for people who maybe I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not too familiar, but I'm sure there's a handful of, you know, competitors like any industry. Can you maybe highlight why someone would want to yep. pick you over some of the other uh, other people in the industry? Yeah. So um, I don't know if you like from what we were talking about earlier about the tablet and stuff. Um, that's our main difference. Most of our competitors take an order and they put it into the POS. And that's great. If you're if you have an exclusivity deal, you're only working with one delivery app. That's probably all you need because you only have one tablet anyways. But when volume is increasing and you have multiple delivery apps, then that remote control becomes really handy. And that's our main difference. Cubo actually not only sends those orders to the POS, but we also give you some more day-to-day tools so you can mm-hmm. actually interact with those orders and get rid of the delivery apps or the delivery app tablets. Um, and the way that translates into more money and more money saved for the restaurant is um, the rest, the delivery apps will like your restaurant a lot more. So they'll rank you higher that auto accept, you know, our competitors normally accept orders in seven seconds. Ours is 0.1. So much, much better than our competition. And because there's less errors, more communication with the customer inventory is more up to date, you know, orders are, are refunded right away, or you upcharge for something right away. The customer is always in the loop. Then, um, the reputation overall for the delivery, for the restaurant, the delivery apps is much better and hence. Your, the ranking is a lot, a lot better. But again, if you're only using one delivery app, probably don't have a lot of kitchen capacity. All this might be an overkill. That's why. I, that's where our competitors thrive. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. And, th- and then I guess to wrap things up, I would love to just hear your kind of vision for the future. You know, I know you alluded to kiosks and stuff you're working on now, yeah. but yeah, what's what's on the roadmap now, and what's coming up, and what, what's what's your vision? Yeah. So when we started, it was, it was all about, you know, third party deliveries, but we have uh, started to um, just from the feedback that we hear, you know, delivery apps are expensive. Restaurants want to use more than just that. Mm. And so we have a lot of tools. We kind of have the sort of like the heart of the overall system, which is, you know, this platform that receives orders can communicate them over to a POS. The restaurant can manage everything from, from Cubo. Um, and so our long-term vision is we want to build this sort of like ordering operating system for restaurants where they can handle everything except for when someone walks up to a cashier. 
But if a restaurant, uh, sorry, if a customer walks into a, a restaurant, they don't want to talk to a cashier, um, whether that's, you know, QR ordering or our kiosk or if the third party delivery app or through their website, all of that is powered by Kibo. Mm. And we want to start building uh, marketing solutions since we're going since we have all the customer data in one place, then restaurants can be really effective with it, you know, send really bad, you know, really valuable journeys to ensure that restaurants are coming back. And the data is going to be is super powerful. That's the goal, at least, because restaurants can now see, oh, wow, you know, we had Angelo who ordered through a third party app, but he eventually came through mm. um, directly and then also then ordered QR code and then came through a kiosk. So he came from DoorDash, but now he's ordered four times in person. Um, and you can continue, you know, doing some remarketing because their customer information is now in one place as opposed to, you know, having to use multiple systems right. to operate. Uh, all of these different channels. Right. I love it. So for everyone listening, check out Cubo.com and it's C-U-B-O-H.com. If it makes sense for you, book a demo, see if it fits and if it'll save you time and money. Uh, once again, I'm here with Juan, the CEO of Cubo, helping restauranters. So Juan, thank you for being on Whisking It All today. No, thanks to everyone listening and thanks to you, Angel. Feel free to check out wist.ai for more resources and schedule a demo with one of our product specialists to see if it's a fit for you.